On a sunny morning in the fall of 2011, 100 scientists from many different countries arrived to a brand new building located on a hill in the campus of the Universidad Autónoma in Canto Blanco, near Madrid, Spain. During three October days, these scientists participated in a symposium on physics at the nanoscale, an event dedicated to celebrate the 65th birthday of Professor Ivan Schuller. Former postdocs and graduate students, as well as colleagues, attended the symposium in its honor. The building was the headquarters of the Madrid Institute for Advanced Studies in Nanoscience, known as IMDEA Nanoscience, a non-profit foundation created jointly by the regional government of Madrid and the national government of Spain. The institute was created with the missions of attracting talent from abroad, performing research of excellence and transferring efficiently knowledge and technology to the society. The president of the foundation is Professor Ivan Schuller, and the director of the institute is Professor Rodolfo Miranda. Well, today is a day of joy. Uh, we came from all over the world, in fact, to um, honor uh, Ivan uh, Schuller. Uh, he, as you very, very well known, it's, uh, is an extraordinary physicist, uh, a very good friend, and a person that uh, uh, qualifies for something that we use in, in Spain uh, not very often, uh, someone that we call un maestro. Colleagues and collaborators of Ivan came to Madrid from Argentina, Belgium, Brazil, Chile, China, Colombia, France, Germany, Greece, Israel, Mexico, the USA, Russia, Spain or Sweden. 48 scientific talks were presented. The talks displayed the current field of research in Ivan works, and those, approximately half of them, were devoted to magnetism, mainly exchange bias, one quarter to superconductivity, mainly superconducting vortices, and the other quarter were dedicated to other topics from structural characterization to theoretical modeling. The title of my talk you can read about Brewon light scattering like. And I realized um, this morning, you know, what can I teach you about magnetism that you don't already know in, in 20 minutes? So instead of talking to you about magnetism, I'm going to... Um, now, one problem with the talks that have gone on so far, we have this expression in English that you should never speak ill of the dead. So if you're at a wake, uh, where people are talking about the dead person afterwards, no matter how horrible the person is. Um, <laughs> people say nice things. They never say anything that's not nice. And, um, well, Ivan's not dead. Well, first off, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for giving me the chance to speak here. It's truly an honor to be here today to speak about my father, Ivan. He's a terrific father and an even better scientist. <laughs> In fact, I can say without any hesitation that Ivan is the greatest physicist that I've ever urinated on. <laughs> so every story has a prologue. And in ours, we have a young boy who's born in Transylvania. There's Ivan with his father, who we all call Tatachuli. And this young boy eventually moved to Israel and spent some time there. There's Ivan on the kibbutz, on the kibbutz down in front. And later, he grew up to be an adult in Chile, and you can see Ivan receiving his diploma. Actually, I met him when I came back to Chile from my a very fresh PhD and a very short postdoc in Berkeley at the end of 1967. He was an undergraduate student in a class of only six. The, our school was very young. And uh, these six people actually made a huge difference in Chilean physics. I wouldn't say he was the best behaved nor the, well, nor the best dressed of all the six, but he certainly was the most passionate. Well, Miguel Kiwi is one of those people, you know, like your, your teachers. There are certain teachers that become kind of key in your life. I had a high school teacher uh, uh, which was key in my life in physics, and now and I had Miguel Kiwi in my relationship in physics. I, when I went to study physics, like all of us, 
I started wondering about the universe, about the nature of time, about, uh, you know, every kind of big questions. He, at that time, he, wanted, he wasn't clear what he wanted to do. Uh, once he came up to me and said he was uh, very interested in tachyons and he was going to write something about that and so on. Then he became interested in nuclear physics and I told him, you know, we were more interested in solid state and so on, which at the beginning he didn't like that much, but uh, later on he changed his mind, fortunately. <laughs> and Miguel Kivi put my feet on the ground and he taught me something and I became the black sheep, so to speak, uh, of going to solid, to experimental, which is the worst kind, experimental solid state physics and do something that I actually can touch and can feel and can, can really do something original as opposed to trying to solve the problem of the universe. Well, our story really begins is with a young man in America. And behind me is a picture of Ivan at his uh, citizenship ceremony. Now this man had an idea. He knew he could only accomplish so much as a scientist. So he had an idea to expand his scientific output. Now this is an experiment that can be done anywhere, in one's basement or perhaps in your living room or bedroom or kitchen. It has very low upfront capital costs. <laughs> Although I must warn you, there's a considerable or moderate cost for renewables and supplies. <laughs> Maybe a million dollars or so. Okay? Now like any good scientist with an idea, the first thing Ivan did was a literature search. So here's some canonical <laughs> texts in the literature. We have where do babies come from? And of course, the birds, the bees, and the Berenstein bears. And what he learned from his literature search was that he needed a collaborator. So here's some pictures of my lovely mother when she's young. And unfortunately, this is the best picture they have from their wedding. <laughs> so here's some initial results from her experiment. He was smart enough to do it twice, just so people would believe the results. Now let me just point out here how well controlled and repeatable this experiment is. <laughs> and what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is lead you chronologically through Ivan's life, starting as a graduate student at Argonne and moving up to his outreach activities. And you've seen some of that um, in terms of movie clips that he got the uh, Emmy for. So I met Ivan when I first went to Argonne National Lab. I got my PhD in 1974. I went there. Ivan was still working for his PhD, and um, we shared an office. And I taught Ivan about bagels. He claims to be Jewish, but he had never had a bagel or cream cheese. Well, Charlie Falco came to Argonne when I was a student. I was a student, and he was a sort of a scientist. And so when he came to Argonne, I think partly as a punishment, he was put in the same office as I was, which was a big mistake because as soon as we were put in the same office, we became a team. When I first went to Argonne, this is actually uh, Professor Hubner, is, <laughs> and, and, and this is Ivan, and so this is, an, this is um, at one of the first group meetings um, I was attending at Argonne, where Ivan was a graduate student at the time, and Ivan had just presented his results and uh, this is uh, Professor Hubner's reaction to what Ivan had said. Why don't we all talk English? Then we'd have some basis for an understanding. <laughs> now, 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 after many years, I've realized, actually, Ivan doesn't speak English any better than he used to. It's just we've all gotten used to it. And so <laughs> we, we just you know, uh, nod our head. And, but nobody really knows what he says. Ivan, my goodness. Um, Ivan, I met when I first came to Argonne in uh, 1975. So Ivan, I think, had been already there for almost a year, so we, we, were, we were almost together. But I've known him longer than I've known um, most of physicist friends of mine. And, uh, so we're old friends. I, I know Professor Sinha since my, my graduate stu studies at, uh, at, at uh, Argonne. Actually, he started me in understanding how to interpret X-ray data. Actually, when I first started doing uh, I went to him and I asked him, and he actually taught me how to do this. And I, I, I remember still setting up computer programs uh, with cards in the olden times, you know, when we, and I did it. Uh, basically, he taught me how to do that. He has these, uh, these, he tells 
always when we go to coffee that I don't understand scattering theory. In fact, he says that nobody understands scattering, meaning he's the only guy that understands scattering. And I used to tell, I still tell him that scattering theory is nothing. Scattering theory is just a Fourier transform, and every elementary engineering student knows about Fourier transforms. The next thing where we sat together, I still remember, in the same meeting, MRS meeting, Boston, December 1-4, when our famous colleague from Japan told us that what Bettners and Müller had published was in fact correct. I still remember that day, because this was an MRS meeting, for two facts. The first one, Guy Deutscher and some other people contacted me, being from Europe, should we not organize a conference on superconductivity? I said, well, what are you going to talk about? There's nothing you, uh, let's forget it. Then this guy came, and I assure you, one hour later, the room was empty, and the whole conference was empty. Everybody left. I didn't know. I couldn't go back to Leuven because I had a plane ticket, not first class like Ivan, but a very simple plane ticket. And I had to wait a couple of days before I could go back. I phoned and said, look, there is something happening here. Everybody went back to the labs to see and if to confirm, to, to confirm this high TC stuff. So moving on. Um, Magnetism entered. Here, here's, that's me, and there's Ivan. In the, and you'll see it's in two scenes. And so these are my own interactions with Ivan now. <laughs> so the magnetic field is increasing. What does that mean? Um, here's Ivan again. The epicenter is up there. Magnetic forces, no doubt about it. <laughs> so that's when we made a very simple system. You take a lead film, you make holes in it. It's lithographically done, it's not so difficult. And here you see the result. This is the magnetization, in fact, the critical current density as a function of magnetic field. And you see here, when there is uh, no holes in it, the magnetization is more or less flat, so the critical current is very low. If you have holes in it, there is a very large increase in the critical current density in those systems. And you have distinct bumps here, which is in fact due to the matching of the vortex lattice and the whole structure in your system. And to show that is indeed true, here you see again magnetization versus magnetic field. And you see the first bump indicates that there is one vortex sitting in one hole. And the second bump, two vortices in one hole and the third bump, three vortices in one hole. And this could be verified by theory. Competition, in a sense, I thought, when we can make holes, it should be interesting to do it also with magnetic, did, uh, magnetic small islands in the system. We tried for two years to make these magnetic islands. I had no lithographic machine. I had to use some from somebody else. And then came, naturally, the paper of Ivan, where he succeeded in, small, in making small magnetic dots together with colleagues, many of them sitting here in the room. OK, I'd, this is just the outline. I'm going to be a little different in the, compared to what some of you have already done and will do, in which you talk about your own research and your involvement with Ivan. Uh, I'll certainly talk about my involvement with Ivan, but. What I'm only going to tell you about is his research that is funded by my office. I've known Ivan since both of us were inhabitants of the uh, Chicago area. I was a uh, professor for 20 years at Illinois Institute of Technology. And uh, Ivan, for a good many of those years, was working in Oregon National Lab. And uh, um, I realized his great talent uh, even in his relative youth. And I, I asked him if he would be interested in uh, uh, finding a faculty, senior faculty position. And immediately he whipped out a list of equipment which summed over a million dollars. He says, OK, this is, this is what it'll take to get me. And uh, being a poor institution, I knew that was impossible. After this first meeting, which was in fact in uh, 1980 at Lake Geneva, near Minneapolis, and then this famous first visit of Ivan Schuller in Leuven, which was memorable. 
1983. Professor Vilserade is probably one of my best friends in this field, definitely. I learned a lot from him, I learned a lot how to organize things, how to produce big things. I learned, definitely I learned about him from Pomerol and Sancerre that I didn't know about it and I learned about French food. Uh, he is uh, a great scientific organizer. He's an ideal organizer. And I'm so sorry that he actually is not involved in the daily operations of some type of operation like this. People in the symposium asked to pick up a single scientific contribution from the work of Ivan selected the fabrication of metallic superlattices. This multilayer material has played a relevant role in many research fields. His pioneering 1979 work on magnetotransport in magnetic multilayer will be quoted as a seed of the giant magnetoresistant effect reported by Ferd and Grunberg in 1987, which deserve a Nobel Prize and 15 years later is working in many devices uses daily. Ivan has always paid attention to the most careful preparation and characterization of the sample. This has benefited his research in very complex topics such as exchange bias, where his achievement has pushed the field to the front page in magnetism. And you may not know, so if when the uh, Nobel Prize is given, somebody writes up a little um, history of, of that particular Nobel Prize, explaining what went before, and in there, there's something's written, that there actually was prior work, prior to that of um, Albert Ferret and Peter Grunberg, and uh, the reports of observations of substantial orders of uh, increase in magnetoresistance, and, but none of them were recognized. The idiots who wrote uh, uh, <laughs> references 9, 10, 11, or 12 had discovered it, they would have been Nobel Prize winners, but they were schmucks. <laughs> so, who should we have contempt for, for being so stupid? Well, three people in this room, in fact. <laughs> Met Ivan in the beginning of the eighties, just by chance, because I read the, one of the main papers of Ivan, maybe the, the most important contribution, in my opinion, that the, this paper was uh, directly connected with my postdoctoral work. And I read the paper and I, send a letter, a normal letter, because it was in the beginning of the eras, it's not uh, email, no nothing, no, email and phone, yeah, email and phone, and the first surprise was the, well, the, uh, he answered me, reply by, by uh, mail, we started to talk about the, the work, he offered me to come to Argonne, and he paid me, this was very important, and I spent a summer in Argonne with him. And another thing that I would like to, to underline that when I arrived at O'Hare Airport, the airport in, in Chicago, uh, he uh, spoke me in, in Spanish. It was very surprising because uh, all, the, the all the communication was in English. The letter, the phone, everything so was in English. No, no, not at all. And this, uh, for me, was uh, very nice. And uh, he gets, uh, he got the, the impression that this, like, this guy likes uh, Spanish uh, everything and was right. I, I didn't know any idea that he was uh, with uh, Chilean education at all, no? So Professor Vicente is a professor, is a Spanish professor. Professor Vicente is probably my best Spanish friend or perhaps one of my major Spanish friends. He is a great guy. I surprised him talking Spanish to him in the airport in Chicago. He almost fell over. No matter what you're talking about, you're talking about money. So one of the, the very first um, person who funded Ivan was Harold Weinstock. But uh, fortunately, years later, he, uh, he ended up at uh, San Diego. And uh, Ivan uh, asked me to come to lunch, and he said he had this idea for using porous alumina as a basis for magnetic nanodots and possibly as sensors. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good, but uh, I really don't have any money for that sort of thing. And Ivan was uh, getting ready to go off to Chile, as he does quite often. 
And then when I got back to my office, I found out there was an opportunity for a new program where that would have fit in. So I sent them an email, and I think he was in Chile already, and I said, you got to get me something in about a week. And somehow or other, he managed to do it. So that's how we started uh, more or less working together. And uh, he had lots of good ideas. Ivan's distinctive approach is looking for clear, transparent, and simple physics. One example is his research on superconducting vortex dynamics in hybrid superconducting magnetic nanostructures. From matching effects to rectifier effects, the background physics could be explained easily in a few words. The experiment results are not only clear, they are also easy to figure out. That's physics a la Schuller. The other thing a professor has to do in order to do research is you have to organize a research group. And Ivan now has just become a professor, and he has a research group, but he's never managed you know, uh, postdocs and students and the like. And so this is one of uh, his very first um, research group meetings, what it is that he expects them to do in the laboratory. There and are no knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are no unknowns. Well, I met Ivan for the first time in uh, the spring of 1992. I just came as an exchange student from, from Germany for a year to San Diego. And um, one of the other students at the university suggested that I should work in a lab. And the, the work that was done at Ivan's lab sounded interesting. So I contacted Ivan and said, hey, how about I work in your lab? And for free, for free of course. Uh, so <laughs> he couldn't turn that one down, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, his reaction at the particular point in time, so I'm busy now, but uh, you know, come back next week and I'll have something for you to do. And Some project like this. Yeah, yeah. And it was very nice. I uh, yeah. had a good time. So Axel kind of told a story about this relationship between us, but he wasn't quite truthful. Now here it is what happened with Axel. Axel came and did his diploma right with my lab before he got his degree in Germany. So he did his diploma, right? He was a very good student, uh, considering that he was an undergraduate, because he did an original work. Now, what happened was that he went back to Germany, got his diploma, and then he called me up one day and said, I want to go to work with you for a PhD. And then I said to him, I knew that he wasn't uh, going, coming to me because I was the most brilliant mind he could find. So he's, I asked him, OK, Axel, why do you want to come with me? And he said to me, I have a girlfriend in San Diego. I said, OK, Axel, you can come. I knew he was telling me the truth. Well, during this year that I was in San Diego, I also met my, my future wife. <laughs> but Ivan now, his research starts coming out, and he's figured out how to run a research group. Um, this really, um, I guess, summarizes what he expected from his students. I mean, it's very simple. There's no more complicated stuff. That was yesterday. What have you done for me today? <laughs> The work of Ivan and his students to understand complex effects, such as this change bias, has involved many different techniques. For example, polarized neutron reflectivity. Among the more striking and unexpected results in a change bias effect are the phenomena related to the experimentally observed positive exchange bias. He's a wonderful scientist. He's a, uh, I'm sure he's a wonderful teacher, although we are colleagues, so I know his students and his postdocs just, you know, hero worship him. My brother and my dad were much older. And so while they would slalom down the mountain trying to control their speed, I, who was barely 100 pounds with all my gear, had to get into a furious tuck just to catch up. And that bothered me, not just because I was losing races, but because by this time I knew a little bit more about physics. This is a book that he gave me, The Cartoon Guide to Physics. And in this book, I learned that Galileo had proved that all objects fall with the same acceleration. So I said, even we have the same size skis. According to Galileo, we should be going with the same acceleration. What's going on? What do you have against Galileo? And he only considered the friction of the skis and gravity, that all the mass terms would cancel out. So he thought about this for a little while. He had an answer for me. 
and it had to do with the drag force from air resistance, which is proportional to your area. So while my brother and dad were one and a half times heavier than me, they weren't one and a half times wider. And that's the reason why they would always go so much faster. If you don't believe it, you can do the derivation yourself. This idea that just by thinking about things, we could understand the way the real world worked. Not useless things like superconductors, but important things like ski. <laughs> I met Ivan in 1984 at the March meeting of the American Physical Society, and uh, I admired his uh, pioneering work in the metallic multilayers, because we had been uh, studying uh, pillow light scattering yeah. in metals, okay. and so of course uh, multilayers from metals were just a hot topic, and so I tried to approach him for samples, and uh, later on, uh, luckily, we started working in this field with Charlie Falco, his former teammate mm -hmm. uh, at Argon National Lab. I call them the dream team. <laughs> Uh, it's around the end of uh, 98 when I was uh, finishing up PhD and looking for a postdoc position. Uh, of course, I've uh, read many of Ivan's paper long before that. And then uh, in the summer of uh, 99, I started my postdoc with Ivan for a couple of years. It was a great uh, uh, working relationship. So Kai Liu came to me from the group of Chaling Chen from Johns Hopkins University. He was, I think he was a Caspia student, which was one of these uh, brilliant students that were brought from China to the US. He became an American immediately. As soon as he came to the US, I think he became an American. And certainly by the time he came to me, he was an absolute and total American. I worked on uh, getting him uh, Alexander von Humboldt uh, ah, research surprise. prize. And so in 2002, he came to Aachen and uh, immediately he went to the labs and although he was not addicted to optics, uh, but we were strong in optics, so he immediately swung the, the lab and uh, suggested a couple of uh, optical experiments, magneto-optics, and so a whole uh, avalanche broke loose at the time. Some of the main motivation in Ivan work are finding new cooperative effect in carefully characterized artificial materials and the competition between different physical properties. This can be illustrated by interface effect in oxide, such as the photo-induced superconductivity or the scaling or the interface roughness in metallic superlattices. It's always a pleasure to discuss with him. He's not easy to discuss, but it's nice to discuss with him because he knows many things, a lot of things. And I think this is confirmed not only by his scientific output, which is uh, fantastic on many, many dis different subjects, but also his ability to motivate young people. And this is uh, not so easy, especially for European professors. When we started, the European professor was standing above the students this was the master, the big master. And then when you discuss with Ivan, he was very interested in what the students said, and not vice versa. First, one of Schul's rules that I learned from my father is that physics is fun. Uh, what struck me most was uh, Ivan was always having fun in the lab. So sometimes he would come down and he would bring liquid nitrogen. We would take things like a rose or a hot dog or some balloons and we'd stick them in. Mostly we'd smash them. So that was always kind of a fun thing to do as a, a child, and it even sparked my sense of wonder. For instance, if you put a balloon in, it always amazed me that all that air could compress into a tiny volume, and then you pulled it out and you'd slowly see it expand as it heated. And in his own words, he can't wait to come into work every day. Work is his hobby. And he joked about this being his secret of his marriage. Right. It's actually a tribute to Jackie for allowing uh, Ivan to spend the time in the lab. And, and it's a treat for, for a student and postdoc like myself uh, to see uh, the many facets of Ivan in the lab. Uh, he's a brilliant physicist, extremely sharp, uh, with this born physics instinct and insight. There's this uh, rigorous and demanding part. It's, Never easy, everything has to be done right with the highest standards. He had this one ability which really impressed me, which is uh, very important in a scientist. 
which is not in an engineer. In an engineer, you know, you have to solve a specific problem. And if you don't solve that, that problem, you failed. In a scientist, somebody gives you a problem, you take the problem, you turn it around, you solve some other problem. As long as you can publish it in a good journal, it's a great problem. That's what Kai Liu is. And it has this uh, uh, positive uh, energy. Right? So it was very helpful, especially when things don't go right. I emailed a few of Ivan's students to see what he did that allowed them to be so successful. So Carlos Monton, who's a current postdoc in the group, says, working with Ivan is by far not easy. He demands you to act and think as fast as he does. Sometimes his pressure is enough to commit suicide. <laughs> okay? There's also the blunt side of Ivan, right? So if uh, uh, some things I did or said he doesn't agree, he let me know straight away, right? Very clear. So he had this uncanny ability of turning the things around, and now he's become the world expert in taking a problem, uh, this fork, uh, uh, first of the reversal curves, probably he's the best, he's the world's expert in this, in this fork, so you know, he, he, he came to become a world's expert in this, and this is an old technique that he did not invent, but he just took it over and just finished it off. I follow his advice. He always tell me, well, now you have to do that. For instance, now it's nanoscience. And I said in the beginning, well, nanoscience, maybe it's difficult for me, Spaniard to do nanoscience. <laughs> and I'm now talking in a center on nanoscience, and I have a lot of paper on nanoscience. No? Jose is, uh, uh, has problems when it relates to some people and he doesn't, but with me, he has this, I think, totally irrational respect for me, and I can say the craziest thing in the world and he'll take it seriously. And so, yeah, he believes that what I say is somehow right. For me, I think it has been one of, of the best choices in, in my scientific career, right, to, to start working with Ivan. Um, he's, of course, demanding, um, and, um, but, but at the same time, he's extremely supportive. Uh, he has been always a, a, a fabulous uh, um, mentor, you know, making sure that we do things correctly. Um, if you passed his muster, there was nothing else in the world that could shock you. And uh, you know, if you convinced him, you could convince anybody. So that's my relation with Axel. It was a great relationship. Axel did many different things in my lab. I can't recall all of them. But certainly his thesis, we had to focalize it, but he did a bunch of different uh, uh, areas, really areas of research in my lab. And I think that many of these areas of research actually continued in his, uh, in his career. Uh, exchange bias, uh, pinning, uh, photo, photo oxidation, uh, many different things in my lab. And he's, as you know, he's a very jovial kind of a fellow. He likes to eat a lot and so he's a kind of a funny guy. From my point of view, Ivan Schuller is an outstanding physicist. I think so. Okay, so why I became a physicist? So I, I wanted to clarify this. The reason I became a physicist is because there was a moment, <clears throat> and I heard this, uh, this from somebody else actually, but there was a moment when a, a medical doctor, a lawyer, and a physicist were talking about whether God would, would want to be a physicist. And so the medical doctor said, of course God would want to be a physicist, and that is very simple. Uh, you know, Jesus was uh, healing people, and clearly God would want to be a, physicist, uh, a medical doctor. And that's why, he became a med that's why he would want to be the medical doctor. And then the lawyer says, absolutely not. It is absolutely incorrect, because before Jesus, there were these, the Jews that, uh, and, and at that moment, they, they, they wrote the, the, the book of laws, Moses' book of laws. So clearly, God would like to be a lawyer. And the physicist wouldn't say anything. He was just sitting there thinking. And they, they, they wondered, is this physicist uh, doesn't think that God is interested in physics at all? They want to ask him. They say, don't you think that uh, God uh, would like to be a physicist? And the physicist uh, looked up and said, uh, yeah, he probably would like to, but I'm not sure he could. <laughs> okay. uh, but he said, science is people. And I always like to say, people make a difference. And Ivan is one of those people who does make a difference. But also his ability to motivate young people. But at the time, I, I didn't really believe that I could be the one generating ideas. And confidence is something I've struggled with throughout my career. And I've been very fortunate because Ivan's always been there to tell me to have confidence, to be persistent, to keep thinking, and good things would happen. And eventually, I learned enough that I was able to come up with an idea that no one else in the group had had, and that formed my first paper. And I felt real good at this point. 
Nothing world beating, but it was enough to get me into Stanford where I went to graduate school. So there's Yvonne and me, that's Hoover Tower in the background. He was passionate about everything and uh, the, the, that's the most fantastic characteristic he still keeps. You know, so I was a Transylvanian by birth, I was Jew by tradition, American by conviction. I, I just realized that, that suddenly all my uh, wine education actually started coming out in the undergraduate education in wines came from Brunserade, where I learned about Pomerol and Sancerre. But you know, I was Chilean by adoption since I went to Chile, and I'm sort of a Spanish by choice because I like it here a lot. But I, I suddenly realized that they have some other components, and I told you this. I, after all this thing, I realized that I'm also German, and I'm also French, and I'm also Colombian, and I'm also Mexican, because all these places I've been to. So I'm very happy to be a world citizen. The thing that stands out to me is his passion, the enthusiasm and the genuine fun he's having in the lab, and that's contagious. And that, uh, I think, is the trademark of so, Ivan. Yeah, and that has influenced me in, in, in my work and a career. Positive person. This is very important, because any difficulty, any person, any situation, he always bent to the positive side, always. And then uh, there are people who make problem. He solve problem. Oh, I mean, I, I, you know, I always liked his sense of humor. So. There's also the, the funny side, right? So he never missed the opportunity to, to crack a joke, sometimes maybe even politically incorrect. We all know what funding agents care about. They care about citations and publications. So, so far, in the nine years since this experiment has been producing results, it's generated almost 600 citations. It's not bad, but I'm not sure that Harold Weinstock will give you a million dollars for that, okay? So I went and I asked Ivan's colleague, Jorge, also the father of my best friend from elementary school, and also an expert in citation analysis. See, he knows how to predict how someone's H number or total number of citations rise in time, okay? So according to Jorge's analysis, by the time I'm Ivan's age, this experiment will have generated 45,000 citations. <laughs> now that, I think, is something we can convince a funding agent to give us money for. Uh, he's always having fun, and he's also very uh, 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 sensitive. So, so the, even the criticisms are not personal. Uh, and every week we have happy hours. He treats the group members, and we have this annual uh, barbecue at his house. He cook for everybody. He's a great cook. He knows people everywhere and uh, always friendly, always talking a lot, uh, discussing a lot. It's very strange, very extraordinary. And he always pulls me with him. I'm not, I don't know so many people, but he always pulls me with him. This is Professor Roy Serrada, and then, oh, hello, how are you? And always very nice. For me personally, it was um, the stimulating and inspiring attitude of him uh, to inspire not only physics, but also cultural aspects to life. He is a modern Renaissance man. Renaissance in the sense that he's not only a scientist, but he is also an artist. Interested in theater, ballet, classical music, painting, writing, in everything. Willingness to try new things, be it theater, be it skiing, be it physics, whatever, challenges is what the, and a positive attitude that he, he could do it. He, no matter what it was, he would succeed in doing it. Be, was it tachyons, uh, nuclear physics, uh, whatever, he would succeed. He would make a name for himself. He is also a wonderful uh, human being and a wonderful friend. And this aspect of him, uh, you know, doesn't always come out. Around this time, um, he was approached by this um, Nano Institute. And they said, you know, we're a Spanish Nano Institute. We'd like to get you involved with this. And um, the first person you'll see is the one who's asking Ivan to be involved with this Nano Institute. Then you'll see Ivan's reaction to this. Well, give you my word, there's a Spaniard. No, good. I've never seen Spaniards. <laughs> but they kept working on Ivan, and he finally agreed. And in spite of knowing too many Spaniards, that he agreed to, to um, get involved with this.
So something that Ivan discovered fairly early on in his career, this is University of Glasgow, their accommodation office, and their conference and vacation office. <laughs> um, I guess they probably had separate conference offices and vacation offices, but they discovered, <laughs> at least where professors are concerned, there's no reason to have separate offices. So um, Ivan noticed this sign, realized, huh? So here was a conference that both of us attended, and maybe several others here, in Aquafreda de Merite, Italy. Most of us were there doing very serious things with non-equilibrium superconductivity and phonons and pizza resistance and all sorts, sorts of stuff like this. Ivan, on the other hand, I'm organizing a lot of conferences. This is the one I organized a couple of years ago. You see, this is the conference organization committee <laughs> in Cancun. It's a real picture. It's not uh, coming out of uh, Google. It's a real picture. I'm sitting here somewhere on the back there as chairman. I think we were together more or less all over the world. Every year at the March meeting, we share a room at the March meeting. We've done this for, uh, I forget now, 35 years. And, um, they're, they're hard days. It's a four day long meeting. We come back and we debrief each other, you know, a year's worth of debriefing. So, you know, we're up until two in the morning d talking um, about, life. about life, about experiences, about, about whatever, about science, about everything. And so we not only shared an office, but then we started sharing a, a room in the March meeting of the American Physical Society. It's a meeting that I've been going since 1974 and we have shared a room since then. Now, my relationship with Charlie Falco has been a very excellent scientific relation. It's going to go up and down. Uh, we obviously had a lot of influence on each other because he has interest in the arts, I have interest in the arts. It's different interests, but and I had interest before, and I'm sure he had interest before. But we had this, uh, and we kind of ha pushed each other. But, uh, and we had re kind of downs in our relationship when we were ready to kill each other, basically. But we never stopped sharing a room. My wife still objects, and I've shared a room in a hotel with him before. I shared it with my wife, I think, and uh, my wife still objects that I have said, she always tells the story that I said to her, absolutely not coming to the March meeting, I'm sharing a room with Falco. Um, that's something you do with somebody who is a good friend, and we both, um it's like uh, we had the term during the Cold War of mutually assured destruction. <laughs> we both know way more than enough about each other to totally destroy each other. And so it's not even an issue on the table. We like uh, culture, travel, but I come back to travel, good wine, good food. So uh, we like especially more or less the same things. We go to restaurants also. He says to me, what do you want to, uh, to, to have? Uh, he always calls me Brian Serrada. <laughs> Never Ivan. Brian Serrada for 30 years. I always call him Ivan. And he says, Brian Serrada, Professor Brian Serrada, where do you want to go? I said, well, maybe Chinese food. I have an, an, an interesting address there. Um, I, I was honored that uh, when he uh, received the uh, Lawrence Award about four or five years ago, um, he invited, of course, his close family to attend the ceremony, but he also invited three program managers and their wives to attend the same ceremony. And uh, it was really very nice. But then he took everyone out to dinner in probably the most expensive restaurant you want could imagine. I mean, you know, you, your vegetables cost about $15 and stuff like that. <laughs> you could be very cynical and say, look, he knows I, I provide lots of funding. Uh, Stu Wolf, he was getting ready to leave DARPA, but he still could have helped them out. But the third person he invited was a guy named Jerry Smith from the Department of Energy. And Jerry Smith was retired. And that tells me that Ivan is genuine in his thanks for the support he's gotten. He is, uh, I can only think of one word for Ivan, and that is he is a mensch, which means a really great guy in Yiddish. But this year, um, uh, I, I can say from personal experience, I had a lot of uh, personal problems, you know, connected with my family and so forth. And I'm sorry? And, and, and the person who was always there for me, the person who was really supportive, 
and the person whom I could count on, who was wonderful, and uh, was Ivan. I mean, I could talk to him about anything. I could, when I was depressed, he would cheer me up. And his wife was wonderful also to, to our family. So I really, you know, to me, that's, uh, to me, it's always been a very important facet of someone's personality, you know. Not just their scientific success, but, you know, can I count on them as a friend? And there's no question that you can count on. I've, when, he, when he's your friend, he's your friend. And I really value that. But uh, I hope at least that uh, for the next 10, maybe 20 years, it can go on like this. This is what I wanted to say. As I close up my talk, I would like you all to direct, as a token of my appreciation to him, to direct and dedicate your applause not to me, but to him. And while I may be the only physicist in this room who shares his DNA, I think we've all inherited some of the Schuler traits of science. Thank you. I must embarrass him. <laughs> Here's my word.